Hello, my name is Margaret Harris and I'm an online editor at Physics World. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on the results of end-to-end -end dose measurements for quality assurance in stereotactic radio surgery on a periodic basis. Our presenters today are Nico Papanicolaou and Daniel Sines. Nico is a professor of radiation oncology and radiology at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center in San Antonio. He also serves as the chief of the Division of Medical Physics and the director of the doctoral program in medical physics at the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences. Daniel is a medical physicist at Mays Cancer Center at the University of Texas Health Science Center, again in San Antonio. His research focuses on stereoscopic radio surgery and radiotherapy operations in radiation oncology. Uh, both Nico and Daniel welcome your questions, and you can submit your questions at any time during the webinar using the question facility you'll see on your screen. We'll have some time for a question and answer session at the end. But for now, I'll hand over to our presenters. Greetings to all. My name is Nico Papanicolaou, and together with my colleague Daniel Science, we will present to you this webinar on our institutional experience with the prime phantom for periodic end-to-end -end quality assurance in stereotactic radio surgery. As a disclosure, we want to inform you that RTSAFE has worked with our team on several projects in the past three years and has provided to us all the materials that were used for those projects. I also serve on RTSAFE's Board of Directors since 2019. Sorry, but bear, bear with us. We're still having some technical difficulties. We'll be uh, starting the Lassen webinar as soon as possible. Developed the first gamma knife model in 1968 during their search for a non-invasive modality to treat functional brain disorders. That was the beginning of SRS as we know it today. The emphasis of SRS from its early days has been on how to precisely localize and treat the areas targeted in the brain. Today, we have an assortment of different modalities from a number of vendors that offer stereotactic delivery systems. The Gamma Knife and the ZAP system are dedicated SRS solutions, whereas the Tomotherapy, the Cyber Knife, and State of the Art Linux all offer SRS grade functionality and treatment delivery, compliant with the APM Task Group 142 recommendations for SRS systems. The aim of stereotactic radio surgery, although the means by which it can be delivered have significantly evolved, remains the same since its inception. The goal was then, and it is now, to achieve geometric and dosimetric accuracy in delivering the prescribed dose to the tumor. In other words, we aim to put the correct amount of dose to a precise anatomical target. One significant development is that for us in the early days of SRS, we treated one tumor at a time by placing the isocenter on each tumor, we can now treat multiple targets with a single isocenter with the Linux-based delivery systems. This change in practice is supported by clinical data that demonstrated improved patient outcomes in terms of large expectancy when patients with more than a full brain metastasis were treated with SRS. APM report 54, that was published back in 1995, spoke, among other things, about the achievable uncertainties associated with SRS treatments. On this slide that is reproduced from the report, you can see the uncertainties associated with different elements of the SRS process, leading up to a total positional uncertainty that was calculated to be almost two and a half millimeters. This uncertainty does not include the MRI distortion, MRI fusion, dosimetry, and the uncertainty associated with image guidance in frameless SRS. We now know that MR image distortion can account for up to two millimeters of positional error. Image fusion has an inherent uncertainty of one to two millimeters, and the image guidance associated uncertainty for frameless treatments is also about one to two millimeters. The dosimetric uncertainty is derived primarily from the challenges we have in small field dosimetry. Assuming all the data are collected properly using the appropriate field detectors for small fields, 
one should expect a dosimetric uncertainty of about 2%. Reflecting on this table from 1995, while accounting for improvements in technology and their associated uncertainties, we are still left with an overall uncertainty for SRS delivery of a few millimeters. It is then very important to be able to accurately quantify all the sources of uncertainty in our own system and to have an overall uncertainty characterization with a comprehensive end-to-end -end test and analysis. In the era of treating multiple metastases with a single isocenter, we are not only to account for the uncertainties that we've just discussed, but we also have to address the challenges associated with off-axis beam modeling, MLC positional accuracy, size of the target, distance from the isocenter, and rotational errors. This opens up a whole new opportunity for comprehensive QA in SRS that goes perhaps beyond just the periodic QA of individual and overall system accuracy and extends into the personalized pretreatment QA for SRS patients. Especially for those patients that have multiple targets of varying sizes, where the geometric and dosimetric accuracy of the system is best addressed with a 3D dosimeter. This then begs the question, how do we perform system in a patient QA in this new era of stereotactic radiosurgery? Preferably, we want to use a phantom that allows us to complete all the necessary tests, including an end-to-end -end test, to assess individual and overall performance of the SRS procedure. 3D dosimetry is an important additive value, as was noted already, especially for pretreatment QA of patients with multiple metastases. In our institution, we have recently introduced the prime phantom in the armamentarium of QA solutions for SRS. Prime is a 3D printed phantom based on a patient CT dataset. It is comprised of bone and tissue equivalent materials. It is cylindrically hollow in the center to accommodate inserts for different applications. We see here images of the cylinder containing the gel that can be used for 3D dosimetry. We also see the inserts for TLD and OSLD, as well as for film. An image of a prime phantom cut in half is also shown to demonstrate the submillimeter detail by which the phantom is printed based on the patient's DICOM CT dataset. Here we see a better view of the prime phantom and how the user can place the cylinder containing the appropriate dosimetry module inside the phantom. 1D measurement can be obtained with the ion chamber insert, 2D measurements with a film, OSLD, or TLD insert, and 3D measurements with the gel insert. Here we see representative scanned images of the prime phantom with the different inserts, including those for MR-related geometric distortion, quantitative assessment, and a new module that contains visible targets for localization testing. It is important to note the high fidelity of the bony anatomy in the images, which is inherent to the 3D printed technology used in manufacturing the phantom. For the end-to-end -end verification tests that you will see in the following presentation, one starts with the patient's plan that already includes the imaging, segmentation, and dose calculation in the patient's anatomy. The plan is then transferred and recalculated to the prime phantom CT dataset. The phantom is then positioned on the treatment table as if it was the patient and is imaged prior to treatment also as if the patient were to be treated. If a 3D measurement is to be made, the gel module has to be inserted in the prime prior to treatment. After treatment delivery, the phantom is scanned in an MRI scanner, and the MR images are analyzed to convert them to dose maps. RTSAVE then produces a comprehensive report that offers a dosimetric comparison between the submitted clinical plan and the measure data based on the delivery of the plan to the prime phantom. This allows the user to perform an end-to-end -end evaluation 
on the quality of the imaging, planning, and delivery. In conclusion then, the Prime Phantom provides a comprehensive solution that addresses in one modular platform all the quality control needs for the implementation and ongoing QA of the stereotactic radiosurgery program. It is a comprehensive solution for end-to-end -end periodic QA and for pretreatment patient QA, especially for the verification of multi-target treatments based on true 3D dosimetry for planning as well as onboard imaging prior to treatment. Thank you. Hello, I'm Daniel Sines. I'm a medical physicist at the Mays Cancer Center at UT Health San Antonio in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, and I'm going to discuss the experience that we've had using the Prime Phantom for periodic end-to-end -end QA uh, in SRS. Uh, as a brief outline, I'm going to discuss the Phantom and its end-to-end and, and -end process uh, that it's designed for, including the different configurations for different dosimeters. Uh, I'll discuss the QA program and the relative frequencies uh, with which we've implemented this tool. Um, I'll go over some of the measurement details and then present the results, our findings thus far, um, for all of the various detectors that this phantom is able to accommodate. Uh, and then go over some conclusions and some of the basic impressions from our experience. So the prime phantom, as has been discussed, um, comes to you with uh, a number of different inserts for it. Uh, so the overall head phantom is the same and you change by swapping out whatever detector um, accessories you want. Uh, so this comes with an insert for a ionization chamber. It comes with an insert for film with fiducial markers on it. Uh, it has one for OSLD dosimeters uh, and also has, can be, can be replaced with a cylindrical container containing uh, the polymer gel um, that can be used for 3D relative dosimetry. Uh, so the ion chamber has the role of providing an absolute dose uh, to make sure that your measurement is matching up on an absolute scale, while the other tools provide a combination of absolute and relative uh, dosimetry, some strictly relative uh, and some also containing a, a little bit of estimation of, of absolute dose as well. Uh, so together, they sort of give you a, a pretty comprehensive picture of your dose distribution and its uh, constancy over time. Um, we were provided before we received the phantoms with a CT scan, uh, as well as structures or contours on that CT scan. Uh, however, we didn't use that plan, that scan for, for our plans. Uh, instead, once the phantom arrived, we scanned it uh, using all of the different inserts for all of the different detectors. So it was a number of different scans that took place. Uh, the phantom was fitted with a mask the same way we would all of our patients uh, so that we can have the experience as close as possible to that, that would have, which a patient would receive. Once all the scans were done, uh, we fused all of them individually to the CT scan with the structures that we were provided with, uh, with a rigid registration so that we could transfer those structures to our current plan and use those uh, as our targets. So for the plans, we did four different plans for each of the detectors that would be used individually. We didn't use the same plan uh, for each one. Uh, and the reason for that is that each one will have slightly different density characteristics depending on what is being used. For example, the gel has the gel is encased in glass. And so we wanna be able to take that into account in the glass in the gel calculation. Uh, so each of these plans on each of the different CT scans corresponds to the detectors, uh, including the ion chamber, which was an A16, uh, the opti optically stimulated luminescence detectors, the film, and the gel. Uh, in the planning system, we utilized Monte Carlo, although pencil beam calculations were available as well. Uh, and the plan was done with uh, five different uh, non coplanar table angles with couch cake. The plans were devised using Brain Labs, uh, multiple Brain Mets SRS in, as part of their Elements software. Uh, this is the 2.0 version. Uh, delivery took place on a Novalis TX linear accelerator with a 6 MV SRS dose rate, um, a dose rate of 1000 MU per minute. 
Uh, and this is on the Varian HD 120 MLC, which includes 2.5 millimeter leaf width uh, in the center. Uh, exact track was used for localization, uh, as well as repeated at all different non-coplanar angles. So for each couch kick, a repeated exact track image was taken place uh, so that we can verify positioning with couch kicks. So the QA program uh, established was done on a variety of different frequencies, uh, including weekly, monthly, as well as annual. On a weekly basis, uh, we conducted ion chamber measurements with the A16. Uh, on a monthly basis, that's when we conducted the OSLD and radiochromic film measurements. Uh, and on a more infrequent basis, on the annual basis would be the conduction of the full 3D gel dosimetry, uh, which was immediately followed by uh, an MRI scan with subsequent analysis done um, by RT-SAFE. Uh, for the ion chamber, um, a recent cross calibration was used to set the uh, NDW cobalt 60 for the standard imaging A16 chamber. Um, PTP was determined uh, at the time of measurement. Uh, some of the smaller correction factors um, were established to be low and uh, subsequently were not tracked. Uh, the PTW webline electrometer was used uh, in its low range due to the small chamber volume. Uh, and our measured dose was then compared uh, with a mean dose of an ROI that was placed in the CT scan um, at the sensitive, ch uh, the chamber sensitive volume. Um, and that was found by registering a CT, um, a separate CT scan that had the ion chamber in place. Uh, for the OSLD measurements, uh, you can see here the insert and how that looks. Uh, there's a places for several different uh, nano dots from Landauer to be placed. Um, they're placed every four millimeters. Um, and in this case, they actually are centered on one of the targets. Uh, our current batch of OSLDs um, was calibrated using a different machine. Uh, and so a subset of them was irradiated to a known dose uh, in a solid water setup to establish the, a correction factor uh, when used on the SRS machine with the SRS dose rate. Uh, OSLDs were read out uh, two hours after exposure, uh, and they're placed in a coronal plane uh, when we did the measurement. Uh, some details for the film measurement. Uh, film measurements were done um, while keeping the film away from any ambient light until the time of irradiation. Uh, we used a film and a calibration that was established by RT-SAFE. Uh, so they sent us the films, we record, we did the measurements and then sent them back. Uh, scanning orientation was kept consistent. Um, we used gloves to avoid um, fingerprints. Um, and you can see the way that localization is done by the fact that there are four different uh, film pricks that serve as fiducial markers so that we can register these when it's time to analyze the dose distribution. And again, the irradiation is done in the coronal plane. Uh, some details for the gel measurement. Um, the gel was kept refrigerated um, after we received it and then placed in room temperature five hours before the irradiation to allow it to come close to room temperature. Um, again, this is a relative detector, but results from the ion chamber can be used to establish the absolute dose levels. Uh, the gel was irradiated using uh, exact track, uh, as we said. Uh, and then it was subsequently scanned on the MRI several days later using a 2D multi-slice, multi-echo uh, haste proton density to T2 weighted sequence. Uh, and we've used we've used this sequence for uh, a number of years now on on uh, different gel phantoms. Uh, analysis was done primarily by RT Safe themselves, um, and this was done by registering the scans, the MRI scans. Uh, with its signal proportional to the absorbed dose, uh, registering that with the DICOM data that was provided by us from the treatment plan. The dose itself was then compared with the calculated dose using uh, gamma analysis, CVH metrics, coverage metrics, mean dose, Z95, et cetera, uh, as well as an establishment of the geometric accuracy by using a geometric offset. 
So moving into the results now uh, for the ion chamber measurements of which we've done five thus far, uh, the weekly measurements all agreed within a maximum of 0.8% absolute difference from the treatment planning system calculation. Uh, overall, the mean percent difference was about a quarter of a percent with a sample standard deviation of 0.4%. Uh, so very good uh, agreement. And this kind of helps establish longitudinal absolute dose accuracy uh, for an FRS program. This graph just sort of shows how those data points look. Uh, for the OSLD results, uh, we were able to obtain, as you saw from the previous image, lateral and superior inferior profiles uh, with four millimeter spacing. Um, they did capture the dose going through one target. Uh, when I show the plotted results in the next slide, uh, the error bars on the measurement will be shown with a 5% um, uncertainty, uh, which has been our experience with using these OSLD detectors before. Um, two different monthly measurements were conducted using the OSLDs. Uh, and so in the, in the, the graph, I'll show an average of the two. Uh, overall findings were that um, agreement within the 5% expected error was found within the field of the target. Um, although we did find a slight underestimation of the dose, um, measuring, measuring a little bit low outside of the field in the low dose regions. Uh, the film results are showed here, are shown here using uh, the dose profile that's indicated in the gray figure. Uh, gamma analysis was a primary way to, analyze, to analyze uh, these results. Uh, the table at the bottom demonstrates with a variety of passing criteria what the passing rate looks like. Uh, so for all of these, we see that our results are coming at it, coming in at 97.5% uh, or better. Uh, gel results are definitely the most interesting of these uh, because there's a variety of profiles that one can make and analyze. Uh, here's a sample figure that um, is able to capture most of two targets and grab the edge of another. Uh, so this was one of the most interesting figures that we found in the dosimetric report. Uh, so in the upper right, we see a comparison of the TPS calculation and the RT safe measured values. Uh, error bars in that figure correspond to one millimeter. Uh, and going through all of the different profiles that they provided us, um, there was little evidence of the dose distribution um, having an excursion outside of, outside of one millimeter. Uh, in the bottom right, we see 1D gamma analysis between the TPS and RT safe curves that were shown in the upper right. 3D gamma analysis was then conducted inside of all of the five different targets uh, with the variety of sizes of them that you can see indicated here. Uh, so the sizes of the targets did vary from seven millimeters all the way up to 20 millimeters. Uh, and this does encompass a pretty wide variety of, of METs, brain METs or anything that would be treated uh, typically with stereotax radio surgery. Uh, and so you see here, um, generally good agreement uh, some of these with the very strict passing, very strict distance to agreement could be a little bit lower. Although it is worth noting that the slice thickness on the MRI scan is two millimeters. Uh, so looking beyond one millimeter can be good for detecting errors, but um, might not be um, fully justified given the slice thickness of the MRI scan. Um, finally, the geometric accuracy is established. Um, by calculating a geometric offset, uh, which is determined by looking at the center of mass of the dose distributions, both the measured uh, and the calculated. Uh, doing that can give you one measure of geometric accuracy for each target. Uh, and as you see in the figures here, uh, the worst we saw was 0.7 millimeters. Uh, and this, in this figure, we also present uh, the distance from the isocenter, which is known to be uh, one of the factors um, that predicts what the geometric accuracy will be. Uh, so in this case, the targets go up to 3.5 uh, centimeters from the isocenter, and we still show um, submillimetric agreement. And that just about sums up um, some of our data that we've taken so far. Um, we are longtime users of RT-SAFE 
uh, phantoms. And we've worked the last two years using the prime phantoms. Uh, and so this is our first time to actually start looking at it on a longitudinal basis. Uh, and it's been very interesting to get data over time and see how that can fit into our overall QA program. Uh, so overall, this suite of tools um, does provide a pretty wide array of tests using a wide array of detectors uh, that can help assess the ongoing accuracy of an SRF program. Um, and it makes sense from a, from a clinical standpoint to conduct some of the quicker tasks such as the ion chamber um, or film measurement um, on a more frequent basis, uh, particularly if that measurement can be done at the same time that a 3D test such as the gel dosimetry could be done. Uh, that way you're using those quicker tests to be chained and linked um, to the 3D test. Um, so that way they can serve as baselines for future measurements, which you know correspond to the good 3D agreement uh, if you do those at the same time up front. Uh, and then you kind of set the stage for regular measurements, which can be used to help detect errors, whether it would be uh, in the MLC or in any of the IGRT practices, um, or whether it would be in any displacements of the panels in the room, et cetera. Uh, this can be a very quick way of, uh, it might not be as quick as morning QA, for example, but it's a very robust way to detect errors because you're directly measuring what it is that's going to be applicable for, for patient care by looking at what the actual measured dose is. So it's a good way of combining um, the end-to-end -end elements, which tests the whole process in one, but puts it in a more regular basis uh, with which you can always look at um, when trying to demonstrate the accuracy uh, of a system. Thank you both for a great presentation. Uh, we'll now take a look at some of the questions that have been sent in. Um, first question is, uh, I think this one for, is for Nico. Um, you, are you both there? You got your microphones on? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, the question for Nico is, can the, the, the detector insert be placed in a specific location within the insert of the prime phantom? And, and the answer to that is uh, is yes. Uh, the the entire volume of the cylinder is um, available for uh, for the insert to be directed uh, at the time of the manufacturing. This has to be specified by the user where they want it, and that is uh, specified uh, by submitting uh, a set of uh, contours that shows exactly where they want the sensitive volume of the insert to be for the ion chamber and uh, then uh, RTSafe will manufacture the, the insert as such so they can point exactly that location. Okay, and a little bit along the same lines, as a question um, come in, it asks, can two pieces of orthog orthogonal film be inserted? And in that, um, the, the, as you saw from the images, the, the insert for the film, it's a single plane but uh, it can be rotated when it's inserted. And uh, at, at the present time, it can assume two orthogonal positions, uh, but uh, it, might be, it might be possible uh, at some point to have uh, a, a calibrated uh, angular system that you can actually lock the insert when you put it in. And that way, when you scan the phantom and when you actually deliver it, the film is in exactly the same position, but you can put it definitely in two orthogonal position as it stands. And then uh, just a quick technical detail. Um, what I have a question about what the dimension is is of the film insert. Have you got that information? That is uh, seven by fourteen centimeters. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, next question, I think, is for Daniel. Um, is the phantom filled with water? Yes. Yes. So you you will fill in for any of the inserts that are used here. Uh, there's a, uh, a a place where you would then pour in water before the time of measurement and they do recommend that uh, you don't store the phantom with the water in place so uh, yes that's the that's the way to that's the way that it's done um, and enter the second presentation again Daniel's presentation um, in in the um, 
in the second presentation that says that there seems to be a big air gap inside the phantom. Is this correct or is it just like an artifact of the presentation? Yes, the way the CT scan is, is done, um, you're seeing air, but what we did is uh, scan every configuration with and without the detectors in place. Uh, and in the final scan, I applied a density correction to, to water in those regions. So um, you're seeing air gaps uh, just to kind of for visualization purposes, but um, it was filled with water for planning. Okay. Um, and next question come in, is it possible to rotate the cylindrical insert inside the phantom in order to get uh, 2D dose distributions in different planes? I think that's the one that we, that we uh, answered already about uh, uh, whether you can put the film in multiple orientations. So, um, but, but yes, it's, I'll refer to the, the answer I was already presented, but you can put in two, two, two orthogonal uh, planes, you can insert the film and uh, one, one could potentially rotate it uh, if, uh, if, it's, if it can be locked in place so you can have it any arbitrary plans that you want to get a 2D distribution from, uh, from the film. I don't know that this is available from RTCF yet, but, uh, but it's, a, it's an easy modification, uh, I suspect, to do that. And that would apply to the OSLD detectors or TLD as well? Correct, yep. Okay, next question is uh, about the target. What is the target used in the regular quality assurance? Daniel, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a little unsure as to the, the nature of, of that question. Okay. I, I, think, uh, maybe... main, uh, I think it's the, the, the target, perhaps it refers to the size of, of the target. As, um, oh, okay. as, as we briefly discussed, uh, in the first question, the, the the user can specify where they want the precisely the location for the insert for the ion chamber to be. So, if it is a for routine quality assurance purposes, um, then uh, then then it should be a, a target that it's uh, um, in the middle of the of the cylinder insert, um, and it should be uh, not not too small. It should be small enough. Uh, but yet big enough for the ion chamber that the user has to uh, to get um, a, a good measurement in uh, in the volume that has been irradiated to the prescribed dose. So so typically for the SRS applications, a target uh, of the size of a uh, couple centimeters should be uh, plenty big and plenty small at the same time to give you a nice consistent reading when you're using an SRS grade ion chamber to make a measurement for a periodic output check. Okay, and on the subject of the, the gel insert, um, does RT Safe supply that gel insert already filled or do you have to do that yourself? The do yes, the insert. Go ahead, Matt. Go ahead, Daniel. I'm sorry, yes, the insert does come filled. Okay, okay. Um, and another sort of question about, about uh, the, the gel filled products. Um, if you have no access to an MR unit, can it, is it still possible to use RT Safe's gel filled products? I think this is not probably one from Nico. Um, yes, I mean, you do have for the gel, um, as Daniel presented, you do have to have a, a special um, scan sequence that you can that you can use to to properly read it out. And, uh, and there are some time constraints as to when you can, when is the best time to, to read the gel after radiation. So one should secure a, um, a scanner to scan it after radiation. But if they cannot, uh, understanding is that RTSAFE does have collaborating uh, facilities in the US that so they can actually scan the gel for you if you ship it to them. So uh, if one does not have uh, access to an MR scanner, then RTSAFE can arrange for the, uh, for the gel to be scanned somewhere else. Okay, another question about the gel. Um, someone says it, it looks like the gel is giving relative dose. Is the gel able to give absolute dose gamma comparison? Uh, the gel is primarily a relative dosimeter, so that's that, that's a correct assessment. Uh, so that's why it's important to have a, a suite of, of detectors in place uh, to to in order to be able to get a absolute measurement at the same time to kind of justify what that is. So I mean, what you could do is look in a certain region of interest, such as where in the gel measurement the ion chamber fit, um, in order to use that as a normalization, for example. Okay. Um, and uh, 
then this is quite another question for Daniel. Um, can I use a patient specific plan for the treatment delivery? Yes, that, and, and that is the idea. Uh, so, I mean, what we have so far is, you know, sort of a standard plan uh, that was sent from RT Safe. But what we've done in the past is use um, patient specific plans. Uh, and so this is something that you probably wouldn't want to do for, for every patient. But of course, it would be a good idea to select some representative patient plans in your population uh, to work with. It is, uh, it, it is one of the um, differentiating you know, features of, uh, of, of this phantom that uh, the, the prime is, is indeed a, uh, a generic uh, patient. Um, it is based on patient data, so it's, it's very high um, fidelity uh, in terms of its anatomy, but it's for a, a standard patient, the anatomy of, of the prime. And as Daniel noted, you can, you can take the patient's plan and you can recalculate it on, on the prime phantom including the arrangement of the beams, the couch kicks, and, um, and, uh, and also the targets, obviously. And then when you irradiate the phantom, whether it is with a film insert or with a gel, you will get a distribution of, uh, of those that is recorded that is specific to the irradiation of the prime phantom with the patient's plan. So that will be a patient-specific QA, pretreatment QA that you can do for that patient. And uh, for all the patients that uh, that is mandated, specifically for those that are treated with IMRT, uh, that were required in the US at least to do a pretreatment QA, then the prime phantom will be um, an ideal way to do it because it allows you to do both uh, 2D, multi, multi-planar 2D if you choose to do so, or 3D dosimetry. Um, but they also, uh, outside of the scope per se of this uh, presentation, Artisafe does not does have the, the personalized QA where they can actually print a phantom for you that is uh, not a prime anymore, but it's uh, that exact copy of, uh, of the patient that you're treating. So they do for that service as well. And that's, uh, that's the specialized QA that you can, you can actually do on a per patient pretreatment QA using um, a, a, an exact replica of the patient's in a 3D print phantom by Artisafe. So slightly different application, but you can certainly do the pretreatment QA either by printing your own phantom for the patient or by using the, the prime where you copy the, the patient's plan on the prime anatomy and measure. Okay, the next question is, has the equipment been tested using a proton beam yet? We do not have a proton beam here, yes, but, I believe they're, they're, uh, but they have, but they have. Go ahead, uh, Daniel, Correct. you. Yeah. Correct, yeah, we, we, we don't have protons at our facility, but uh, the RTSA Phantom has undergone some, some studies with proton beams. I'm, I'm, I'd have to refer you to them for the details, but I know it's been done. And Nico, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, it just, uh, I, I know it was done, it was done successfully, um, and, and I believe uh, some of it was, uh, um, was done in, uh, in Germany, uh, I think it was Munich, uh, maybe, uh, but uh, I'm sure the RTSA folks uh, can provide more information on that for those that are interested. Okay, we're running a little bit short on time here, so I'll just ask a, a couple more questions. Um, are there any restrictions regarding the position and size of the targets? So for the for the cylindrical detectors that you see here, uh, we are limited, I guess you could say, to the to the cylinder where the gel can be inserted. Um, some of the previous RT Safe Phantoms I've worked with, the personalized gel phantoms, um, are have a have a wider array um, anywhere in the brain, for example. Um, and if there's any other specific questions on on locations and limitations, I would also refer you to RT Safe for those for some of those details. So I, I just uh, adding adding a, a bit more detail to that, uh, the the cylinder is a, of, of a certain size, and anything that fits inside the cylinder uh, will be measured. If it's uh, with gel, will be a 3D measurement within the, the confines of the gel size. If it's a film or on the size of the film or the OSLD, as as we noted that you put in there. If um, so, as long as the targets or some of the targets are inside that uh, the volume then you will get uh, you get a very good reading 
if if you use a personalized drill, the one that does not have uh, the cylinders but is filled entirely with uh, the, the whole cranium is filled with gel, then you get a true 3D dosimetry. For lesions that are very close to uh, to, to brain, uh, to the to the bone uh, rather, uh, to the skull, then uh, the dosimetry is going to get uh, uh, a little bit challenging to at the interface between bone and gel because you cannot really measure the dose in the bone. So, but the whole, pretty much the entire uh, uh, brain parenchyma is, uh, is available for measurement. So you can capture any, any tumor and because of the gel being a uh, very high resolution or limited only by the resolution that you, that you scan it in the MR scanner, uh, you can measure as, as small or as big as, of a target as one would be willing to, uh, to irradiate uh, with uh, the gamma knife or Linux. So you can certainly do uh, measurements, for example, for um, things like acoustic neuromas or targets for trigeminal neuralgia, you can certainly do that uh, very well with uh, with the gel, but also with uh, the radiochromic film. Okay, I think we're running a little short on time, but thank you to everyone in the audience who asked a question. If your question wasn't answered, don't worry, we did receive it, and you'll you'll hear from us uh, by email with an answer. If you'd like to watch this webinar again, it will soon be available on the Physics World website, so please recommend it to your colleagues. Uh, my thanks again to Nico and Daniel, and thank you to everyone who's joined us today. Thank you all. Goodbye. Thank you.